Good morning and warm welcome to all the participants to this 21 day summer school on recent trends of sustainable livestock and crop production technologies vis a vis climate change. And today we have with us uh, Dr. Muhammad Abbas Shah, scientist, senior scale agriculture entomology, ICR Center Institute of Template Horticulture, Srinagar. And uh, the, today the topic of discussion is pastoral systems, some entomological considerations sir you are audible and your presentation is also visible you may start sir okay thank you uh good morning all <clears throat> this this lecture was scheduled for yesterday as you can see from the date but uh, i met with an accident yesterday uh luckily i didn't sustain in any injuries so today we will go with it good morning all uh so pastoral systems uh, I will be using this in the broadest sense to include all sorts of forages and uh, uh, pastures, unless otherwise stated. Uh, so I'll try to bring bring into your notes that some of the important topics uh, that are trending or that are of importance for us and for the uh, livestock production, sustainability of livestock production and how climate change is constraining that so from uh, insect and entomological point of view uh, so i have divided this uh, talk into four parts first of all i will give the brief about the dimensions of pastoral entomology the old school pests and their management and a few topics that are of uh, concern these days and then I will immediately switch over to climate change, how that's constraining all the systems. Then I'll give a brief overview of hardy pastoral systems the way forward and how this system can be of uh, use and profitable way of production of fruits and uh, along with the fruits, the production of different uh, forage crops and like that and how the two can complement each other and how they are, you know, they can possibly have negative and positive effects. And finally, I will give a brief overview of a very, uh, you know, very uh, trending topic of push-pull strategy the, of pest management and how the forage crops and uh, uh, the systems available with IGFRI, the Grassland and Forage Research Institute, uh, they can have their say and their part to play in this. Uh, is that still audible? Yeah, 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 you are audible, Dr. Abbas. OK, thank you, sir. So first part, I will give a overview of the insect pests. And then we'll talk about how the stored forage grain seed is affected by insects. Then two interesting topics that caught my attention, the blister beetles and dung beetles. Uh, we'll give a uh, talk briefly about those. So in this section, I will rush through quickly, because most of you are already well aware of the pest management. and. Uh, uh, now, for the sake of completion and coverage, I have included this part. Now, among the major insect pests of forage crops, the first probably that uh, comes came to my mind was the diamond back moth, Blutula xylostara, the common pest of uh, our uh, brassicas. Now, they almost exclusively uh, feed on brassicas, uh, but they can damage the uh, forage crops when the caterpillars are abundant. Uh, mostly these crops when they are grown along with the forage crops they can migrate from one crop to other when the infestation occurs very early in the crop and lower densities are not a problem in, for forage but a problem uh, in food brassicas because of the cosmetic effect of presence of caterpillars and pupae so you can think of the crops that are damaged by diamond back moth <coughs> army worms excuse they are very polyphagous, so damage to pastures is caused by the caterpillar stage, uh, as you know very well. The young caterpillars will damage emerging grass during spring, but older caterpillars uh, can continue to damage in the later part of the season. The amount of damage caused over a given period of time depends upon obviously the weather conditions. And cereals are more susceptible to damage than pastures. Pastures can be followed by very high population, and the forage may be rejected by stock. So palatability uh, and other, uh, you know, the the desirable and the look of the uh, forage uh, can be a problem. 
for this our uh, livestock. Cutworms, uh, numerous cutworms. Cutworms, as you very well know, they prefer on young, uh, young broadleaf plants, including brassicas and lucerne. But sometimes uh, damaged emerging grasses, such as new pastures, following old pastures or minimum tillage in spring. So uh, cutworms not only damage the crop, establish uh, this. Uh, they can be a problem in established pastures, uh, as well as the crops that are uh, grown, annual crops, for example, different lucerne and similar crops. The first sign of infestation are numerous small holes in the foliage, and larger caterpillars cut stem or tender plants, causing them to fall. So this uh, probably you know very well. They feed mostly at night and shelter in the soil, and seedlings are particularly susceptible to cutting by old caterpillars. They leave the establishment during fallow period, damage occurs mostly in the later part of the uh, spring. Now, this depends upon the uh, location, what we are talking about. Uh, we have a certain grass, this uh, antherid caterpillar. So it's it's a kind of hairy caterpillar, as you can see from different hairs. The pastures in first described as uh, heavy, often result in little economic damage. So they feed a little bit on the foliage. But uh, hundreds of caterpillars per square meter once cause light damage to Yorkshire foie gras and perennial rye, rye, uh, rye grass. So occasional pests, we can call them, but they can be a problem. And the whole crop is lost if uh, it's not managed at proper time. We have chaffer beetles and you know, and numerous species of chaffer beetles, more than, I don't know, 100 species in India. The damage caused by these is from feeding by the grubs or we normally uh, the damaging stage is white grubs, as you very well know. Uh, beer patches, they cause cause uh, beer patches and appear in the pastures from mid autumn to late winter. Uh, perennial species seem to disappear first. Closer examination of soil surface will reveal tunnel, tunnel entrances, which is usually next to a low mound of thrown up soil. Now, these are soil pests, uh, soil dwelling pests, but uh, they can be a serious problem and cause severe damage to uh, pastures and uh, they are a very uh, serious problem in case of say, golf courses and uh, stuff like that in heavy uh, infestation the soil can be part you bury the pasture so chaffer beetles numerous species of chaffer beetles field cricket field crickets as you know the black field cricket i'm talking about here can be especially troublesome in autumn all pastures that have an open sward are uh, overgrazing or heavily stocked are prone to soil dying and cracking and subsequent infestation, which means that soil cracking predisposes our pastures to the attack of crickets because they like to dwell in cracks and crevices. Uh, black cracking clay, so obviously black soils, they are more susceptible to this kind of damage. Crickets uh, feed outward from cracks and consume most types of pasture plants, including germinating seeds, very polyphagous in nature. Ryegrass, uh, foxfoo, tall fescue, flaris. Some of them are tolerant, but uh, partly they get damaged. As you can see, they have rendered the grasses uh, completely dry. Lucerne flea is a problem for uh, lucerne. They eat the green tissue and despite come does not does more damage the clover, clovers, clovers. Uh, young limbs initially eat small uh, holes and leaves, uh, creating a speckled appearance. In an advanced stage of attack by the insects, only the wings and ragged portion of the clover leaves are left, as you can see in the picture. Heavy infestation of lucerne flea in pastures can, can reduce the amount of feed available to stock and reduce the palatability of the remaining feed by fouling. So a uh, little bit of damage can be uh, uh, can cause a severe loss because the uh, cattle or uh, our livestock, they reject the feed that is infested with lucerne flea. Uh, newly sown pastures that are attacked may not uh, establish properly. So this is something to look for. <clears throat> now we have a couple of mites. Actually, many, my, many species of mites, earth mites commonly called as. They are a problem for many growers and most of most cost mostly cause the industry several million several million dollars. Their management can be you know uh, costly, and the damage they cause can be also severe. Uh, 
Uh, the red light earth mite commonly damages clover and other legumes. The mites feed by rasping the surface layers, as you know very well how they uh, consume the feed. Uh, legumes may be damaged at any stage where seedlings and young plants are more susceptible. Large population of blue oat mites often occur in pastures, but not. Now, finally, the many species can coexist. Uh, juveniles may feed on soil microflora. So that creates a more problem. You know, barren, barren ground, they can still persist in uh, fallow or uh, fallow land or barren ground. So this is uh, uh, a pest which is creating problems and how climate change will affect it. Uh, probably you'll discuss a little bit about that as well. Then aphids, they can be occasional pests. Uh, many species of aphids uh, that are pests on uh, food crops and uh, lucerne has a specific effort to it that theory of hysterophily. No, normally they are not problematic, but uh, the use of uh, broad spectrum pesticides, they can eliminate their natural enemies. And then these pests can become problematic. And then we are also, it's uh, obviously advisable to use specifics and broad spectrum insects are to be avoided. Uh, mole crickets generally damaged uh, is most evident in Bahia. The presence of mole crickets is usually first evident uh, with the occurrence of their tunnels. They are burrowing close to the soil. Uh, so they burrow the soil and they can feed on any very broad uh, post range and they can feed on any type of uh, this uh, forage crops or other uh, plants or grasses growing. Oh, finally, we come to a bunch of slugs and uh, a snail. Uh, they can be problematic. Uh, they attack a broad range of plants and most damaging when they feed on germinating seeds, grass, forage, and cereals. Uh, killed slug appears most voracious. And uh, uh, now, again, they cause fouling of the, this uh, produce and the, the cattle can reject it. So that was a brief overview of this, uh, of all the pests. And uh, so as you might have noticed that I have not given any uh, management guidelines or management strategies. So as you know that uh, forage crops and uh, uh, stuff like related to that, you the economic thresholds are different as compared to the food crops. Uh, so that for that, you have to seek the guidelines of IGFRI. And for insecticidal control, as you know, uh, we represent a national organization, ICR. And we cannot recommend insecticides that are not in the schedule, in the schedule of CIB and RC, Central Insecticides Board and Registration Committee. So for any specific pest and specific situations, we have to seek the guidelines which are in, uh, which are registered with the CIB and RC. So I uh, prefer to avoid all the recommendations for that. And one final point to add to this is that, uh, uh, this coverage of pests is obviously not exhaustive, and this is based on international experience of uh, pastures and forage crops. And some of the species that are present in India, some are not present in India, or we might have a different scenario. And that uh, obviously is uh, falls under the ages of IGFRI, and uh, they obviously are doing a tremendous uh, job at that. So this obviously is not a uh, an exhaustive list, and uh, specific region specific and uh, and country specific uh, assemblage of pests so we can seek that information uh, from other sources so having said that now we move on to some more interesting topics so forage crop uh, seed that is stored so four major pesticides you can see here is that uh, moths and a bunch of beetles that can cause uh, damage to our seed that is uh, stored for uh, our next crop for oats, sorghum, maize, barley, cowpea, cowpea, lablab, and other pulses. Uh, you can see from the photographs that if the seed is infested by some of these pests, they can render the whole stock to dust. Now, luckily for stored seed, we can use insecticides, uh, even without the you know uh, guidelines of CIB and RC. So mostly cypermethrin dusts are recommended for the control of these things for the control of uh, moths, moth caterpillars, and for uh, beetles, uh, malathion and other uh, similar group of insecticides are recommended. So uh, that's briefly about the pests of 
uh, stored forage seed. Uh, we can discuss if anything needs clarification at a later stage. Now, the more interesting topic that caught my attention is the blister beetle. Now, blister beetles, we know they can cause problem to human beings. They can cause formation of blisters. But uh, for our uh, livestock, how they can be problematic? Well, I'll just briefly read. <clears throat> Excuse. Now, they uh, owe their name. They release a certain toxin called as canthridin. Uh, now, the real problem, uh, I'm talking about hay. Hay that is stored, say, uh, for this is problematic for horses, mostly for horses. Uh, when these insects are handled, they exude this yellowish fluid. Now, Meloidae family, 118 genera, more than 2,000 species, out of which 107 are reported in India. So, very good work has been done in India. And I tell you what needs to further to be done. Several blister beetle species found in alfalfa, ash gray beetle. Uh, black blister and stupid blister. Uh, the real problem is that uh, uh, this can thread in the bed which they release uh, when the beetles are crushed or when they are touched, even disturbed. But even the dead beetles, they have high content of this toxin uh, they contain so which puts a little bit of uh, constraint on how do we deal with this situation uh you know the dead beetles even if they are lying this straw this hay and the hay is even tried it can still be toxic and cantharidin is highly toxic and it is the gastrointestinal tract and urinary tract which can lead to death so that is the that is the real catch here it's estimated that about 30 to 50 stripped Blister beetles could be potentially lethal. Uh, fewer beetles, if they consume one, two, three, fewer. Sores and blister on tongue, mouth, colic, diarrhea, bloody feces, uh, elevated temperature, increased heart rate, increased breath rate, dehydration. So uh, they are problematic even when they are consumed in non lethal doses. Hay infested with blister beetles is a big concern for hay producers and livestock owners, especially horse. As I said, cattle and sheep can also be poisoned. Levels of toxicity have not been established. So this is uh, something we should, which we should uh, say. I'm not really sure about how this, uh, how big this problem is in India. And uh, this, this is uh, the aspect. And uh, this is probably the way, this is probably one of the topics that needs concentration, further concentration. So actually, while uh, this planning this lecture, I was thinking of you know what to say. There are there were I could uh, you know uh, see three ways of uh, delivering what I wanted to say. There first was is what we did and we talk about that. Now obviously this topic uh, we have not done much work ourselves here, and but a lot of work has been done at IGFRA. The second way was that uh, to done what others have done and to give, give you a brief overview. And the third way was actually what should be done. So I prefer to say what should be done. And based on that, I have uh, you know uh, made a uh, brief overview of what has been done, what is problematic, what's trending, and what can cause issues further. So based on that, I believe blister beetles can be a real interesting topic to work on. Then dung beetles. Dung beetles are very, very, very interesting. If you might have seen some latest literature. And uh, you know, uh, I came across one paper which suggested that you know, uh, dung beetles orient themselves based on the position of the whole galaxy, the Milky Way, which is very, very interesting. Which means they have, uh, their, uh, they, they might have something to do with their electromagnetic fields in their brains or in other parts of the body, and how they orient themselves with respect to the position of the stars, uh, their how they orient their movement, and like that. Now, dung beetles, no, that's one part of it. The other part is that their ecological service that they render for us and uh, the, for the ecosystem. Uh, very amazing and very interesting. So I'll, I'll briefly read from here. Dung beetles that use dung of warm blooded herbivores for food, breeding, and other activities. 420 species of dung beetles go from India. And these beautiful pictures are from uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, from Tawang and Sis. Uh, this is this is a, a species from Arunachal Pradesh. Tawang is one uh, town there. Uh, 
Dung beetles deliver important ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling, waste removal, and seed dispersal. Now, that is there by removing dung from the surface. The flies and parasites that feed in dung, so they are controlled. Burrowing, aerating, and mixing the soil increases this nutrient cycling as well as improves the water holding capacity. This is the amazing service, and uh, I'm not sure how much work has been done on these aspects. Uh, so most of you might have visited Shimla or uh, 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 places uh, higher than Shimla, and some of you might have visited uh, places like uh, Gulmarg in uh, UT of JNK, uh, where the uh, tourist point of tourist attraction is the uh, horse ride. And as you can see, where there are horse rides, there is a lot of filth and a lot of tongue lying around, which uh, you know uh, makes the place you know less attractive and stuff. So probably someone should work on this. How you know we can uh, uh, employ the services of dung beetles for ecological restoration and maintenance of resorts. Uh, you know, it's not like we. Uh, import we have lots of diversity ourselves and the uh, most uh, uh, trending topic in this kind of work is the uh, stuff uh, related to uh, conserv uh, conservation biological control where we create situations uh, such that the uh, resident population of uh, certain target insects it, it increases so that they do their job more efficiently. So it will either include the removal of constraints or other stressing factors, and uh, making available uh, stuff that they need and that's which is short in supply. So this is something probably to think about. Dung beetles. Uh, now we quickly switch over to climate change. Uh, you know climate change. I'm sure many people might have talked about it before. And uh, now when we talk from entomological point of view, we have to think of uh, in three aspects, the direct effects on the host, how climate change affects the host plants, how they affect the insect herbivores directly, and how they affect the interaction of these two. Now, which obviously means that the situation is very complex. Uh, so I'll give a brief overview of it, and I'll give the principles of it. And then uh, now, first we talk about the temperature, rise in temperature, the response of insects, response of insects to temperature. If you can see here from the graph here, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. So there are two points. There is something called as the minimum threshold temperature and maximum threshold temperature, and this is the range within which the insect can thrive. And if you consider this, that this as the rate of uh, development and you can see gradually it increases with temperature to reach a certain maximum point we call the optimum temperature then it falls again which means say uh, for example for most of the insects say let's talk about uh, we did some work on mythos persiki and we found that the minimum threshold temperature is four degrees four four degrees centigrade and below four degrees centigrade uh, there is no development they will either die or uh, just remain there for a couple of days and there will be no development and uh, by going to four and a half five six the uh, duration of development from uh, say nip to adult is uh, close to 30 days at five degrees centigrade now as we increase go on increasing up to say 24 degrees centigrade the uh, developmental period it reduces to five degrees centigrade uh, sorry five days only five to six days now, if you go beyond 24, say at 28, you know, it, it increases again. It becomes, say, more than six, uh, seven or eight days. And uh, beyond 30, there is no, uh, the survival is reduced considerably. And uh, say less than 20% of the insects will survive. And it will take even longer, say, nine to 10 days. And beyond 30 or 31 degrees, there is no survival. That is the basic response of insects to temperature and maybe most other organisms. Now, keep, we have to keep this thing in mind, and this this is where everything plays out when we increase the temperature due to when the temperature increases due to climate change. Now, obviously, climate change means one and a half degree increase, say, or two max at the end of 21st century. 
Now this 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 range uh, varies from four degrees centigrade to more than thirty. Obviously, it will not be such a huge change, but it will be some some things will change, and I'll tell you what what and all has been uh, studied so far. That is the one part of it. Second part is say carbon dioxide in enrichment. What will happen by what ha what has happened actually, and what will continue to happen due to increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere? So as you know that, uh, so I'll directly go to something. With the increase in CO2 concentration, the carbon accumulation will increase, which means nitrogen dilution effect will happen. The ni nitrogen content of leaves will reduce. Say, see, plant biomass will increase, leaf toughness will increase, but the quality of the nutrition of leaves for insects, that will reduce which translates as decrease in survivorship growth and fecundity of insects and increase the rate of consumption decrease the growth rate which means the insect will have to live longer to consume enough food and prolonged development time as i said now this translates this part increase in food consumption means increase in food consumption and prolonged development this means their losses will be more uh, and decreases survivorship and fecundity, which means the population growth will, will be constrained from this point of view, but other factors will play as well. Now, when the insect lives longer, it is uh, susceptible to parasitoids and other natural enemies, so maybe that will increase the mortality factors. Now, uh, all these will work together and decrease the herbivore abundance and richness, which means that species richness and the uh, incidence of insects it will decrease due to uh, carbon dioxide accumulation alone now if we put together uh, increase in temperature and increase in carbon dioxide what will happen now four or five effects that have been studied in detail and that are almost established it uh, i have given a brief summary of all those things increase uh, first and foremost is species synchrony synchrony between the pest and the host plant synchrony between the pollinator and the flowering dates synchrony between the natural enemy that the parasitoid and its host because as you know parasitoids they are state specific and uh, that synchrony is very important under natural conditions now common examples i have given you say bud burst like that and flowering in case of Plants. I mean, the clearest cases studied for climate change induced asynchrony is the winter moth. Up to 90% of its eggs have been reported to hatch before bud burst of its host plants, the oak. Now, this is in this situation, the incidence and losses due to winter moth will be reduced because most of the eggs they hatch before the uh, food is available in terms of leaves or before the bud burst, which means most of them will die. So, this is the most established case of uh climate change so far uh with respect to species syndrome similarly differential geographical range expansion range expansion now insects they will change their range of occurrence geographical distribution i'll talk about that later and which can cause the spatial type of asynchrony between the pest or its host plant and similarly in case of pollinators and bioagents the second most important uh, you know established effect of climate change is that uh, plant volatiles the vocs volatile organic compounds as you know they they mediate the intra and intra specific interactions plants they release certain kind of low molecular weight compounds which are which help to either attract it, its pests or their natural enemies or to deter them and everything else that cover, that happens between and volatiles are one of the most important way of communicating between species so what will happen that uh, it's reported that the concentration and duration of production concentration and the period they will increase under warmer climatic conditions now what will happen that higher concentration of ucc ethyl jasmonate and methyl salicylate they are likely to keep the neighboring plants under alert which is ecologically wasteful and the damage due to herbivory may be higher so they will attract more number of pests and they will have to spend more more energy on say defense mechanisms which is ecologically uh, not uh, recommended okay 
uh, stronger cocktail of uses might interrupt the interspecific communication resulting in poor performance of pollinators and seed dispersers. And you understand that very well. Like warmer temperature, the production of an emission of views is likely to increase under CO2 enrichment due to direct relations. So as I said earlier that due to carbon enrichment and nitrogen dilution, the uh, CO2, uh, sorry, the yes, VOCs, their composition is likely to change a little bit. It has been suggested that the production of monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes will increase due to disturbed CN ratio due to CO2 enrichment and some effects are already documented for many plants, coniferous and oaks. Uh, so th these are established effects basically. So uh, if anyone is interested, he can explore further. And uh, the third effect, perhaps the most uh, um, scalable, uh, uh, which is happening at a large, large, largest scale, is the change in the geographical distribution. Uh, thermal to as I explained earlier, how the thermal tolerance works. So let's say in a certain location, the minimum temperature or maximum temperature goes beyond 35, which usually never did, uh, say, temperate regions, say, maximum temperature goes to 35. Let's say it goes to 37 now. Now, that will reduce the, they will put a uh, stress on the upper threshold level, upper threshold tolerance limit of temperature for the certain insects and they are likely to migrate to locations which were earlier uh say that are no that do not experience 37 which means that some places the insects will reduce and others they will uh, increase their incidence now this is a uh, what bethesty and larson this is probably the largest meta study basically it's a meta study they have uh, collected data on large subspecies and summarized many things and where uh, they grouped the all the uh, this species studied into various uh, categories. Say so first is that where the effect is already visible and it's established. Second is that where the one of the causes is climate change, but effects are visible. And third is where models indicate that you know it's likely to happen or maybe it's already happened. The study revealed that the most common reason for range expansion was the suitability of winter temperatures and thus reduced mortality in the uh, novel areas, winter temperatures. Uh, the third category includes many of the major pests, say Kylo, Sia, Kylo, Sopricial is the, uh, this borer, Sidia, our uh, modeling moth, helicover, bud fruit, borer, Leptino, Tarsa, the uh, potato beetle, Austrinia, maize borer, Blutla, you already know, Rocola siphons uh, as an aphid, and Bacterocera is a fruit fly, all major pests, and their range shifts are ha happening already. It has become clear that expansion along the latitudes is most likely along the latitude, to, uh, along with elevation. And we say, for example, in Himalayas, so we can we can uh, expect there certain pests that were earlier not uh, available at certain elevations, say from two thousand meters. They will be available in the next few years because it's warmer and it's the winter temperatures they will allow the insect to survive in all those locations and we can have the range expansion that's uh, they are similarly sometimes the longitudinal longitudinal uh, other effects the most common question that is probably cast, uh, asked to entomologists that what will happen to the pests uh, by saying that you know it will will the damage increase. Are we going to have more pest problems? Are we going to have less pest problems? So here is a summary of that. Now, as I already said, crop damage may increase due to higher number of generations in a season, say increased volatilism. I said they say a couple of degrees increase, they will uh, say for one species, blue cloud, they indicate that two more generations that they normally have. It has been done at least 20 years back. So two more generations in a, in a year were for a non diapausing species which means at least one generation we can expect for all insects. And the second aspect would be decreased food quality. As I said, the nitrogen dilution and carbon dioxide, carbon enrichment. Food quality will reduce and uh, so the insects will have to consume more. So obviously crop damage will increase, first thing. In general, the productivity of plants is known to increase in CO2 enriched plants due to increase the photosynthetic activity for plants. Uh, increase the availability of carbon might alter the CN ratio of plant tissue and potentially lower concentration of protein. Okay, the Budaria. 
uh, fading and sec the secondary secondary metabolite profile, as I said, it's expected to change. Losses will be more. It is generally believed that herbivore insects would respond to altered plant physiology in one of the many uh, increased food intake, reduced growth rate, increased developmental time, reduced food, uh, food conservation efficiency. This is food uh, conversion efficiency. This is interesting effect of climate change. Food uh, conversion efficiency of insects will decrease. So to compensate for all the uh, nutrients required, they will consume more. So that's one thing. Uh, this could reduce the herbivore abundance. Abundance and richness will decrease diversity. Uh, how are the losses? They are likely to increase. Styling and coronals, and this is another uh, meta study. They uh, reported several responses of herbivores. Say this is only in response to CO2, probably. Uh, they approx they report that 22%, 9%, 5% decrease in abundance, radio growth rate, and pupil weight. So pupil weight decreases, which means the uh, fitness of insect is decreasing. 17%, 4% increase in consumption rate. See, 17% increase in consumption rate. So yeah, that's going to be uh, uh, very noticeable. And people are going to notice that a bit too. It's increasing. Development time at elevated uh, CO2 level in comparison to ambient conditions. Now, there are one more summary of 42 studies, carbon dioxide and temperature together. Now, I'll briefly introduce you to the complexity of issue. They reported that the leaf nitrogen will decrease. Obviously, the secondary metabolite did not show a significant change when poor factors were operating. Insect biological parameters related to growth rate, frequency, survival, pupil weight were affected positively, which means they increased. So, related growth rate will uh, increase, fecundity and survival, pupil weight increase. Uh, and negatively by increasing CO2 and temperature alone. Uh, Say so temperature will decrease all those things and CO2 will increase respectively and did not affect when the two were carried out. But our situation is still not very clear. That is the first part of it. So yeah, uh, I have, I have uh, just put in two photographs here. And FAO has come up with a document recently, this year or last year, Scientific review of the impact of climate change on plant pests. It's an IPPC document, very interesting, very amazing. So now since it's approved by IPPC, it has a, a policy value. And if anybody is working on uh, this aspect, he can consult this document, specifically for pests. And uh, this one beautiful book by Bill Gates that was published after, or maybe during the lock, last uh, COVID-related lockdown. How to avoid a climate disaster. This is probably the most uh, clear summary and uh, uh, book of compilation of information, general information on what climate change means and how it's affecting. What are the sources basically? They have given a very beautiful discussion on uh, what are all the sources of particularly the CO2 and how they can be mitigated and what are the other technologies for a general read and it's highly recommended from my side. And the third aspect, uh, we'll briefly discuss about the push-pull strategy. Uh, most of you might be, uh, well, you know, introduced to this concept, and uh, it's being uh, promoted by ICIP, the International Center for Insect Ecology and Insect Physiology and Ecology, in, uh, Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, as you know, it's a behavioral manipulation, so lots of uh, semi chemicals. Uh, we make our target crop unsuitable or unattractive for the pest and at the same time lure the pests away towards another source where they are easily managed so basically that is that uh, say uh, visual distraction non-volatile hosts anti-aggregation pheromone alarm pheromone oil poison deterrent anti -fidant. all of them if we use in a certain crop against a certain pest they can you know uh, make the uh, crop less susceptible to damage so visual distractions uh, color non-host volatiles as i said plant volatiles have very important role in attracting the pests and if we for uh, some reason uh, for somehow we say let's just spray a certain kind of chemical which is a deterrent for the uh, pest or which masks the uh, volatiles produced by the plant uh, like that uh okay 
and at the same time we deploy another set of uh, uh, behavioral modifying chemicals or uh, strategies such that they become those plants become more attractive for these pests and in the process uh, excuse so probably the most significant uh, uh, success has been achieved with vegetative diversification with the intercropping and trap cropping for the management of seal stem borers particularly the maize borers in africa so what they did was at least four species of stem borers are there causing a tremendous loss so what they did was that they planted uh, napier and sudan grass within the uh, uh, napier and sudan as trap crops outside the uh, maize plots and molasses and desmodium they were planted as intercrops between the uh, maize rows so for this, uh, you know, they had to increase the row spacing of uh, maize a little bit. Say normal recommended 60 centimeters, so they use 75 to accommodate molasses or testmodium. Uh, and they achieved a huge success with that. It's very cost effective and other things. Uh, then came the issue of climate change there. As you know, they grow the crop uh, maize there as well, uh, rain fed rain fed crops and uh, now it's being interrupted with the larger uh, periods of water stress uh, and unfortunately one of these components the desmodium desmodium could not tolerate uh, longer periods of uh, moisture stress so they came up with a climate smart push pull strategy now they are looking for more sources uh, that can tolerate our this thing moisture stress as well as can uh act as uh um, pull uh sorry uh, yeah yeah push for the push part of it and now this is relevant to you guys and us all that uh, since you have all the diversity of all the grasses napier sudan molasses everything else just morning you have all those things uh we can explore it for any any set of crops uh, this is probably uh, the main message for, for showing these slides is that uh, you know uh, IGFRA scientists working at IGFRA and stations they have all the diversity and all that is needed is evaluation and we are always open for collaboration on any any and every aspect of these things from entomological point of view this is cost effective this is climate smart this is a uh, sustainable uh, every 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 advantage it has and it can work wonders and this push pull strategy is on fast track for you know that professor zia rahman he uh, probably might get a full prize for all these techniques because he has worked with the uh, uh, very very small holding farmers in africa and they are actually getting results with minimum input so this is some technicality involved and how uh, this uh, uh desmodium it repels desmodium uh, uh it releases volatile osmine terpinoline uh and this similar kind of stuff that repel the borer uh, moths when they come to lay their eggs and at the same time uh they have planted trap crops of uh, napier and they are at they release hexanal and uh two hexanol, two hexin and one all and uh, similar volatiles that attract the moths and luckily these napier and uh, other grass they once they the moths they uh, lay their eggs on these trap crops these uh, crops they the trap crops they are known to produce a certain type of gum like substance and that kills the hatching uh, immediately no uh, the first in star caterpillars that hatch out of the eggs and the system works fine there it can work for us and but we need to uh, get to it so this is one example of which is being which was done which is being done in mexico southern america uh see uh brachera panicum lolium dysphania crotalaria tagetus you have all these things so what they do is that they basically evaluate it and how how they can you know uh respond to a certain type of uh 
target pests. So they are working on Swadhopra project, but the fall army or fall army or as you know, can be a huge issue. It is it is an issue already for us as well in India. Uh, so they are already working on it. We should probably also start working on these things. We have much more diversity since we have a tropical country uh, like Africa. So we have lots of diversity of grasses which can possibly act like that. This is just for inspiration purpose. Finally, our hearty pastoral systems. Uh, if you uh, look at the picture, this is not our own picture. It's uh, from some uh, uh, American, probably. And as you can know, how they cultivate their fruit crops. The most popular for orchard floor management, I'm talking about orchard floor management here. Here, please pay attention to the lower part of this uh, picture here. So the most common method of uh, popular actually for orchard floor management is development of ground vegetation alley between the tree rows. So the vegetation, it has to be maintained between the rows. And the plant rows, plant rows, they have to be kept vegetation free. This is the best method that has been worked out. This uh, And this is in relation to agronomic factors, say, uh, non-competition with the main crop, uh, soil erosion, infestation of rodents and everything else now here comes the question of uh or the best of systems as you know it's being evaluated has been evaluated and lots of grasses uh and uh, other crops that can be planted in this alley now it will grow definitely it will grow and this space will be efficiently utilized but it has a cash to it it can possibly increase the incidence of some insects, may decrease some insects and increase sub, or decrease the incidence of beneficials, say predators and parasitoids. Now that there comes the entomological part of it. Uh, of course, it's there. Now ground cover it can provide additional sources of nectar, pollen, and shelter for arthropods. When I say arthropods, I mean pests and natural enemies together. Over time. And in general, you to increase in diversity and abundance of the insects and other both harmful and beneficial. And ground cover flora may provide up to more additional food source for natural enemies. However, the number of harmful arthropods is also likely to increase. So I'll give you a summary of one study. Probably the most studied system is uh, for the effect of uh, alley crops and uh, the incidence of certain insects. The hope actually here is that you know, uh, since nitrogen enemies, their uh, population development is constrained due to non availability of food source in terms of uh, nectar and pollen, mostly nectar, and uh, habitat uh, when the main main uh, prey is not available. Now, by uh, providing cover crops, these two factors increase, and it's likely that the incidence of natural enemy will also increase. And we hope and pray that uh, the increased incidence of natural enemy will uh, control that certain target best. Here, uh, uh, this incidence of spider spider mites in case of uh, uh, this is certain uh, clementine. Clementine, this has been studied in most detail. Uh, so what they found was that uh, some perennial grasses uh, they were unsuitable for the this uh, phytophax mites. As you know, the two spider spider mites, they do not uh, spend the whole season on those uh, food crops. They spend most of the season on uh, uh, these grasses on the underground uh, on the ground vegetation. And when the time comes, they migrate onto the trees, and there they cause the damage. So what they found was that uh, a certain type of grasses. They are less preferable, unsuitable. They are unsuitable hosts for these phytophagus mites. So specifically, they found festuca. Festuca. So it's very amazing effect they found. Spider mites. Uh, in comparison to wild cover or bare soil, as you can see, the incidence of tetranax or decay, panonax tree, both they decreased drastically decreased, as you can see there. There is some year-to-year -year effect, and uh, obviously it's a field study, so still i would say you know the results are amazing and they recommend actually the cultivation of festuca as ground cover vegetation in the clementine uh, grows you can see those papers uh, now different assemblages are reported to help and control variety of insects and say now i'll give you some of the other things 
say grassy and uh, flower strips now flower strips do not come strictly under this this thing but grasses they are believed to reduce the incidence of rosy apple aphid in case of apple intercropping with aromatic plants such as ageratum marigold basil are reported to reduce the incidence of spirea aphid in case of apple again buckwheat Procedia elizum elizum are reported to help control tartar seeds the uh, borers uh, leaf 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 uh, folders uh, yeah that, that's all from my side and uh, if i hope i have not taken more time yeah uh, uh, thank you dr abbas for a very comprehensive and elaborative presentation regarding I, the... should i uh, you know take this off slides now yes yes you can unshare stop presenting I think it's a very uh, important area uh, in which there is a need to collaborate uh, so far as studying the role of forage crops, especially perennial grasses and legumes in uh, not only orchard floor man management, but also in augmentation of uh, forage resource availability and also to study some ecosystem services. And one of the main ecosystem service benefit is the regulation of this uh, pest management. So it can help us in uh, what we call as integrated pest management. So you uh, have deliberated on push-pull tactics. So there is a need to work on that uh, as well because less work has been done so far as this area is concerned. And I uh, request all the participants to interact with the honorable and respected speaker. And uh, if they are uh, they can also put their queries in the chat box or directly interact with our speaker. I have seen uh, over the last few sessions that participants are not interacting much. Uh, it's good that uh, people are appreciating uh, the presentation, but uh, only appreciation <laughs> uh, i think they should also interact because uh, interaction also helps us to learn a lot so we may know what you are grasping and uh, whether you have any doubt or you you want to supplement or complement the information that has already been presented I think Dr. Shahid from SCOST has joined. Uh, I don't know whether he is there or not. Would you like to say something, Dr. Shahid, on this? Dr. Shahid? Dr. Shahid? I don't know whether he is there or not. I don't think so. He's here. I think Shahid is not here. I have received uh, most of the assignments, but still uh, some are really, uh, some have not uh, submitted the third assignment. But uh, some assignments are very, uh, I mean, people are casually submitting. I would request all the participants to take a very serious note of it and submit in a very comprehensive manner. Whatever you know about a particular subject, for example, a one page assignment does not suffice the purpose. It has to be two to three pages at least with uh, proper references so that we can understand uh, your, uh, uh, I mean, the knowledge of a particular subject. Because at the end of this uh, summer school, we are intending to have a uh, maybe a sort of a uh, what I can say post uh, this um, uh, questionnaires will be distributed will be uh, shared with all of you. So the questions will be asked from the presentations itself, whatever has been presented in various sessions. So certificates will be given only to those who at least secures maybe 75 to 80 percent of whatever 
will be asked in those uh, that uh, examination i think there are no more further questions yeah. i request all the participants to join back at 2:30 thank yeah, you thank you uh, on the basis of uh, on behalf of rrs srinagar igfri bihar animal sciences university and uh, national agriculture development cooperative limited baramulla i once again uh, take this opportunity to express my immense gratitude uh, for sparing your valuable time and sharing your expertise and experiences uh, with the participants i hope that all the participants might have uh, immensely benefited by your presentation thank you dr abbas once again and see you on some other platform thank you thank you much. thank you sir thank you thanks for having me